a warm welcome for everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, David uh, brought up a couple interesting things uh, about the A6000 and that uh, Sony's marketing uh, is probably not up to where their engineering is and I think that's kind of where I stepped in is because as a manufacturer of photographic accessories I have to basically test everything so I have three uh, full safes full of equipment Canon Nikon Pentax Olympus I basically have a camera store and all the lenses and all the flashes and everything like that because I test very rigorously all of the cameras and I want to know what they do what happened with the A6000 is a very interesting story. I, uh, I purchased some uh, Sony gear from Sony and when they sent it, they put in an extra box in there with a Sony A6000. And really no comment, just a, the, the box was in it. I thought, wait a minute, what is this? It was you know just a test, not as a gift or anything like that. And I, I pulled it open and I thought, well, why would they send me, a professional photographer, this thing that looks like a little point and shoot. I didn't understand it. I really didn't know anything about the Sony A6000 at all. But um, I got on Google and I did a search and it said that it was the world's fastest autofocus, which really got me interested because uh, I have twins that are two and a half years old and they dart around like little uh, hummingbirds, right? And so uh, I was very, very interested in fast autofocus, no matter what the format was. So I opened the box and I started playing with that autofocus and I couldn't believe how fast it was and then I looked up the retail price, it was something like $800 and I thought, okay, well I definitely have to buy one of these because there's, it's just, uh, you know, fast autofocus is something I really need. Now I have the A99, the A77, the A7R, the A7 and um, I use those, you know, for my professional use. The funny thing is, is that most, I'd say 95% of the time now, this is the only camera I use. And even for professional applications, and I'm going to show you a uh, professional shoot that I did, and I used the A6000, which is quite interesting. I think it's exciting because it's a very inexpensive camera, and it puts a lot of power uh, in the technology, features that actually are smarter than I am with ma my manual override. And that's something that's interesting. Typically, professionals really don't like to get into the automation features you know it's just kind of like oh well, that's a silly feature and all that but I have found that if you set this camera correctly uh, and it took me quite a while to figure out how to do that uh, it actually makes decisions faster than I would and the same decisions that I would and that's pretty amazing and I'll teach you exactly how to set that up and how to turn its mind on and and get it, uh, it to work for you but so what, what happened with Sony is that I don't have a formal relationship with Sony. As soon as they started coming out with the, I think it was the A77, um, I contacted a, f a friend of mine who uh, was, was with Sony and I said, do you guys know what an incredible camera you have here? Uh, it's uh, the one thing that, that I think is really exciting is the viewfinder, the electronic viewfinder. The A77 has an OLED. These all have an OLED viewfinders, but they're very, very fast reacting. So there's no kind of pause. In fact, it almost fools you into thinking that you're looking through an optical viewfinder, which I think is fun because not only does it have that, but it also has the ability to what I call pre-chimp, which means that you can change the exposure. Uh, if you want to go overexposure, you can just wheel your knob into overexposure and watch the exposure change. And if you want to put it in black and white mode, you can turn it into black and white, but it's all in your eyepiece. And that's really fun. Then, not only is that in your eyepiece, the ability, the ability to preview what you're about to shoot, it also has gobs of information on the screen. So just imagine that if you're, uh, you know, Canon or Nikon, it's like driving a car with a glass windshield. But if you're with uh, the Sony, it's like your fighter pilot with a head, heads up display. And you have the ability to see all of these metrics and all of these things. And once you learn how that works, you can control them from inside the eyepiece. And then once you have control of this whole thing, then you can just like uh, do anything that you want. So there's many things that it can do. It can do macro, it can do um, beautiful landscapes. And I have different settings for all of those. And it's customizable in the buttons and I'll teach you how to do all that. It's, uh, what's also interesting too is that it's quite a complicated camera. 
actually it has more features than the professional ones. The A7R, the A99, they, they don't have the same features as this does. And I think I counted like 125 different settings under seven menus or something like that. A vast, vast uh, amount of changes that you could do to personalize it for your own use. And then you can memorize those different settings for your own use, which I think is really nice. How many of you actually have the 6000? Oh boy, you're going to really enjoy this class. Because um, my friends are all professional photographers. And, uh, well, not all. I have some friends that aren't. But, I, you know, I'll hand them the camera and I'll say, you got to see this thing. And, you know, and they'll pick it up and they'll, and they'll stare at it and they'll go, huh. And I look at them kind of goofing around with it. They have no idea what to do next. And you know what happens with me as a uh, photographer who knows all the different cameras and everything like that? I wind up taking a camera and automatically setting it to the parameters that I know. Well, here's an example. If you are shooting uh, Canon, which I shot forever, you have maybe one out of 43 focusing spots. And you can move those around in a joystick, or you can put it smack in the center, and then you know lock on the eyeball, and then recompose. And I'm the center lock and recompose person. So if you were to sh see me shooting, it looks like I'm nodding all the time, because I'm locking on the focus and then recomposing. That takes time, and that also requires that the person doesn't move. So what winds up happening is if you're shooting a wedding or if you're shooting children on the move, um, if you want to lock on that autofocus, then you have to you know, do that nod thing. If you put it on what's called continuous focus or AI servo, what happens is, is the optical system cannot properly guess what it is you want to focus on. So if it's a bride and she has a bouquet, it, it just for some reason, if you're on AI servo, will lock on the bouquet. The bride's uh, face is out of focus. If you're shooting uh, someone's portrait, it'll focus on the nose tip, especially when you're using fast lenses. Like I've got this really cool uh, 55 1.8 Zeiss here. Um, so on the other cameras, I absolutely cannot use continuous focusing. I have to lock it, recompose, and hope that the subject doesn't move. Well, obviously, you miss a lot of shots like that. With what's really cool about the electronic viewfinder, what, what we'll just now call the heads-up display, it will track the face. And it'll go around, and it'll go doot, 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 just like your iPhone uh, or, or your Droid or whatever, your, your uh, portable camera. When you turn it on, you'll notice a square goes around the faces. Well, that technology's been around for years, and yet it's not possible with the optical. The other thing too about, and, and so, and I'm 100% I'm accurate about this, the optical viewfinder is going to fade into history. It has to, because what's going to happen is once you understand how to unleash the power of your A6000 or your uh, A7R or, or any of the Sony ones with the OLED viewfinder and this technology, you'll go up to a camera store and you'll say, um, you know, maybe you're looking at the Nikon D4S or some other $7,000 camera, and you'll say, um, oh, well, how do I activate the eye autofocus? And then they'll say, uh, it doesn't do that. What about face tracking? What about face recognition? None of those can do that because of the optical limitation. Then you add to the technology that all of these guys are mirrorless, and that's incredible because mirrors are really kind of an old technology. I mean, it has to have something that goes with this thing that kind of flops up a piece of glass that goes up and down and then uh, is optical and while it's going up it's, it's shutting off your view to the image so you're stuck. Unless you're in live view you can't see the moment that you caught. Electronic viewfinder will shoot right a a and capture without having to uh, block your view. So I think those are going away. The mirrors are definitely going to go away because the bodies, the technology is just getting that much better. And um, and then, of course, the OLED viewfinder is going to be the way of the future. So let me go through a couple of things that make this camera so exciting. And I just want to show you what it's capable of doing. The first thing that I thought was amazing is that it does 11 frames per second. And th that 11 frames per second sounds pretty cool. In fact, I'll show you what it sounds like. Because those of you who have one, so this is what it sounds like. 
That's kind of fun. I just took 12 <laughs> shots. Not only did I take 12 photos, but what happens is because it has the object tracking, those 12 photos will most likely be very much in focus. It's very, very fast. In fact, it's the fastest, most complete autofocus in the industry. I'll talk about contrast detection versus phase detection uh, in just a second, but I wanted to show you just some examples of what you're able to do with this type of a thing. So right here, uh, my son's dropping something. You can see it like on the fly. It's, it's very, very fast. But this one here, um, my daughter is reaching out for a bubble, and I have this thing focus locked on her face. So right there, boom, the bubble pops, and then as you see, a bubble goes in front of her face, but her face doesn't go out of focus. It stays in focus. And then, let's see if we'll go further. Oh. And then right here, same thing, where he reaches out and he pops the bubble. Like it literally can go and grab that while it's happening. Here, this is an amazing thing. The bubbles are crossing in front of his face. And yet the camera knows, even though he's moving around in the frame, not to hit a bubble. That's really, really cool technology. And what I find in photography is that the great shots, the ones that you miss, are the shots in between the ones that you got. So much of photography is about timing, like when do you hit that button? And then when you hit that button, will the shot be in focus? Will it be exposed properly? What I like about shooting so many frames per second is that I nailed a shot because it's getting so many different frames. Now, it's a lot of editing, but it's fun. It's really fun to go through and just, you know, see things like this and just go, wow, you know, nailed, nailed that shot. Here right here is, um, I was doing, uh, my friend has a, a horse show, and so what I did was I put this on the 11 frames per second, and you'll notice that that's a good shot, like the, the you know, tail's all out, and we're in the middle of a jump there and everything like that, but then, uh, so that's a pretty shot, but then some of these are not so pretty, and so what would typically, like, like right there, that's not so nice, that one's really not so nice, and then if you, uh, if you aren't maybe a trained, uh, equestrian photographer something like that you'll miss that shot it's it's very to under, easy to understand how you would but with the ability to face track and focus track and 11 frames per second you'll get it you know what's neat about face tracking or object tracking is that um, when it knows that you want a face it's going to expose for that face it's not going to um, be fooled by whatever uh, your subject is moving around. So in this example here, I have, uh, so my daughter is, oh, I hope this works. I'll just show you right there. Oh, I uh, wanted to show you that too, and I'll come back to it. But that was, that was eye, eye autofocus. Let me go back to it. I want to show you how this works. Eye autofocus is something that is a new technology I'd never seen before, and it's pretty cool. If you're a portrait photographer, you like the very fast lenses because you like to have that beautiful compressed look, that dramatic uh, look like you have right there, and everything in the background's out of focus. That's what you want for portraiture. It's not as interesting if everything in the background's in focus because then that looks like you took it with your iPhone or something. In fact, fast lenses are basically one of the reasons that we go with these complex systems. Interchangeable lenses, fl the ability to control multiple flash systems and things like that. That's all uh, reason to go toward a more advanced camera over your iPhone. But again, what happens is when you're trying to hit that eyeball, you have to either move the joystick around on the eyeball and hope that eyeball doesn't move when you hit that trigger, or you've got to put the, the spot on the set center lock that focus, re reposition your crop, and then fire hoping that your person didn't move. And as a person who shot weddings for 20 years, I know I've lost a lot of images, a lot of great expressions because the nose was in focus or something else because I wasn't fast enough to sit there and then do all of that while all that was going on. So what, what winds up happening when you get this camera is you have to understand that technology because you could, as most people would, program it so it behaves like what you know. If I didn't know that it had all of these 
artificial intelligence, heads-up display, decision-making capability, I would have put this thing on focus, movable spot, and then I would put it on autofocus still, and then I would have been shooting a Canon or an Icon. So all of this work that these engineers in Japan did to make this incredible technology would have been turned off because I didn't even know it existed. And that's what's really cool about having a revolutionary product. They put in features that you don't even know you need until they give it to you, and then now it's indispensable. I mean, like your iPhone. Like, whoever thought a phone would be playing movies or browsing the Internet until, you know, Apple did that? Same thing with eye autofocus. Once you figure out that eye autofocus exists, man, it's dispensable. Did you see right there? The little dot came across and hit her right in the eyeball. I'll do it again. Right there. I press a button. I'll show this to you live and then it focuses on the eyeball. In other words, it looks at the entire screen, says, yes, I know there's a face, and I'm gonna find the eyeball. Right here, what you'll see is as I'm moving around, if you're on a regular camera and you go into heavy backlight like this, that subject's gonna go completely dark because the camera is doing uh, what it, it's called matrix metering, I think in Nikon, uh, or multi-zone metering in Canon. What it's doing is it's taking the entire scene and it's trying to figure out what you're doing like what do you want I have no idea and that's the best that it can possibly do under the the physics of having an optical viewfinder but when you have a smart viewfinder that has the technology to track your subject then it will expose prioritize for that subject in other words this is how smart it is if I were shooting a Nikon or a Canon I would have to be on spot meter no doubt about it now, spot meter doesn't follow your focus dot around, it's the center, okay? So, here's what would have to happen. As that you saw that go back and forth, I would take my camera, put it on spot meter because I want the face in, and then as it's going back and forth, I would have to do a focus lock and an exposure lock at the same time while remeasuring every time the camera moved. So I'd have to crop and refocus, so focus lock and expose lock, or maybe I would think, you know what, we're eventually going to move in front of the bright window. Let me just open it up and fix it in RAW or something like that later. And um, I, d I, don't, I don't shoot in RAW. I think it's a good idea, but I just don't have the patience for it. And plus, my, my uh, technical accuracy is pretty good. Um, so, but, uh, but with this, you can shoot JPEGs all the time. And it's quite an easy camera to use in the beginning, and then you can customize it to do some really crazy things, and I'll show you how that works. Now, this right here is a great demonstration of this face technology. So what happens is, is that as soon as I put this into a crowd of faces, it's going to put a circle, or a little square, on all the possible faces that are there. The camera knows that these are people, and so it wants to know which one do you want. So what I do is I do a thing where I choose the face and I put that lock on autofocus right there and then I'll choose that person or I could actually do this with face recognition and uh, record I think a dozen different faces and in that crowd it will find the person that I recorded in the morning and it will pr prioritize on that but watch what happens there's a double s double square over this girl now other squares are forming this uh, see how the squares are forming around other people's faces but as she walks around, it knows Gary wants that person. See the other faces? It doesn't get confused. And what's neat about the, she can walk off, completely off the screen, come back, and it'll know it's her. Uh, what do I do at that time? Oh, his shirt. His shirt got, <laughs> that was really funny. We did find, I had to, I had to retrack again. Once she walked off, I think it thought that shirt looked like her face, which it actually did. Um, but you'll see right there that it, it prioritizes on her. And this is something where, again, I cannot move that focusing point back and forth. And oh, so there, there it happened. So she actually went off the screen. And you would think the camera would forget about her, but then it does remember that that's the person that Gary wanted, even if she left the screen. And that's something that's quite remarkable. Again, if I were to deal with one of the typical cameras, I would have to then move my joystick back and forth to find that girl. But you know, she's in front of a black curtain. 
So what will happen is it will try to do an average metering for the entire scene, say, wow, we're really heavy on the black, let's open it up, and the poor girl would be overexposed. But because it knows that I want a face, but not just any face, I want that face, not that face, not that face right there, but that one, it'll properly expose and fire on that person. And boy, once you start to play with this, it's so much fun to goof with. It's kind of like, um, you see those war movies where they have the drones showing all the, you know, the soldiers coming in, they got the squares going around, and then, you know, uh, with the infrared footage or whatever. This is kind of like that. When you walk around with this thing and you activate it the way that I'm going to teach you, it's, it's like, boop, 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 and it's doing all of these uh, thoughts. What's nice about all of that thinking, like I said before, is it will make decisions that I, as a professional photographer, would do, but faster uh, than I would be able to do it. We're going to hold questions till the end. Um, so that is, uh, that's how that works. And I'll show you again with our model how this works. Now, as a system, there's nothing about this that is lacking for professional use, other than it's not rugged. Like if you hold a, you know, an A7 or, or a, um, A99 or whatever, they're titanium bodies and they're really rugged. This one is, you know, of course, lighter weight, very, very portable. I took it all around yesterday and shot at the 9-11 Memorial. We just got some really incredible shots. 23 megapixels, by the way. So it's not, it's not a toy. And, uh, you know, I did, a, I did a chart, by the way, comparing the... Nikon D4S versus the Canon EOS 1DX. I think they're both about 6,500 bucks. And sensor size, I think, what, does anybody techie know what the D1X is? How many megapixels? It's, I think it's 16? 16 megapixels and it runs, I think it'll do 10 frames per second or something like that. And you've got this little guy who's going to pull out 23 megapixels at uh, 11 frames per second, but with focus tracking, right? One-tenth the cost. So um, one of the things that you'll find is, yes, it's not as rugged, but other than that, there's nothing that it can't do that a professional would need. For example, uh, lens interchangeability. You can completely change the lenses as you want, and then you can uh, mount any of the Sony system flashes on here. So it'll take the entire speed light system. You can also do off-camera flash because it has wireless. And then if, you, uh, if you're already in, say, Canon or Sony Alpha or Nikon lenses and you want to maybe not have to change all of your lenses, the neat thing about these new wireless, uh, not wireless, mirrorless bodies is that you have the capability of changing with an adapter to other families of cameras. So for example, this is hilarious looking, but this is a Canon 70 to 200, and I can put this on my um, Sony a6000. So any of you who, uh, find my dot, any of you who are very, very into the Canon system or whatever like I am, I have so many Canon lenses. Uh, you know what lens I really like is the 1428 rectilinear Canon, but uh, you can put this on. And so now you've got yourself uh, the ability to basically put on your Nikon lenses or your Canon lenses or whatever and switch out. This is something that you can't do because in other cameras because the body will allow you to do that and have uh, different um, adapters. The other thing is, is that because, uh, so see there's a little spacer here, and all these contacts on the back talk to the autofocus and the exposure modes. So that's one of the big reasons people say, oh wow, I've, I've got such a huge investment in Sony or, I, I'm sorry, Nikon or Canon that it's really going to be expensive for me to switch. You can hang on to your lenses. The other, but they've got some really nice customizable lenses for these guys. I, I've got these fun uh, Zeiss lenses, and they're called, these are the E-mount lenses, so they're much smaller, much more compact than the Alpha ones, which would fit on, say, the A99 or A77. But my uh, collection of Alpha lenses can also go on here because they have an adapter for that also. So 
In other words, anything that I could do on a professional camera, high speed sync, this one will go up to one four thousandth of a second, um, interchangeable lenses, flash control, it's, I, I can't think of anything where it's lacking. I mean, yes, there's wish list. I wish that the, the screen would turn around because I myself do a lot of videos and so I like to you know see what I'm looking at. But uh, other than that, I, I really can't see a lot of things that are missing. The, uh, the buttons are all completely customizable. I think there's eight customizable buttons. So you can change and reprogram things. Like you can hit a certain button and it will automatically upload to Facebook or something like that. Let me show you a shoot I just did. And this is actually a professional shoot that I did. Very, very simple. You know uh, when a photographer is pretty skillful if they don't need to bring a lot of stuff <laughs> because uh, they, you know, they can master their gear without having just, you know, just a ton of gear. But this right here is a uh, pretty inexpensive Photix Odin flash and the Photix Odin receiver. And what I'm doing is I'm doing double camera off flash with uh, the Sony a6000. And what we're doing right here is we're taking a very backlit day, which would have very ordinary lighting, and I'm firing off the flash and using the a6000 with a standard kit lens, standard pancake lens. So this is what it looks like in the uh, viewfinder. And I'm putting it on manual mode, and that's one other thing that you can do. I like to go in manual mode uh, so I can have my choice of shutter speed and aperture and let the camera do the rest of the automation. The camera using auto ISO and uh, different things like that will we'll change things around. But what I've done here is I wanted to take the sky down, which if you come to my, is it 11 o'clock class? 12? Uh, if you come to that class, I'll teach you how to control the lighting around. But uh, so in that shot right there, I have everything that I'd ever need. High speed sync. I have the ability to shoot manual to control speed lights uh, via remote. And I've got a 23 megapixel image. So there's nothing lacking, and, and this sounds very interesting, but I could confidently shoot a wedding or something very, very important with one of these. And the format, by the way, is very nice. It's very fun to have something so small to, uh, to carry around and shoot. The other thing that it'll do is it will upload straight to Facebook from the sensor. And I was interviewed by PDN uh, Magazine, it's a photo industry reporter magazine. And they asked me what I thought was wrong about the uh, SLR industry as it was shrinking in size. And I said, well, it's very, very simple. The first company that makes a camera that will upload directly to social media will then be the one that advances very strongly because we only see social media images, at least most of the, the kids I know or even us, and so what happens is they're all done on iPhones. But if you can imagine having spectacular images from a DSLR, or not a DSLR, mirrorless, these are, these are now mirrorless, but maybe you know full frame or an interchangeable format, and put it up on Facebook or Flickr, and then it says, taken directly from my camera, maybe it says Sony a A7R or whatever, people will go, my shots don't look like that. I want, I want that. That's the best way for a camera to advertise itself, is to, as soon as they come out, put it up, let it go on Facebook, let it have a tag on it that says, shot from my Pentax, whatever. They, I don't think they've done it, but, uh, but that's the way that we get back. Because if I take a picture on my camera, I have to take it from there, I have to stick it in here, upload it through some kind of a browser into my, cam uh, into my computer, from the computer, hook up to Facebook or whatever, and then upload. Well, no one's going to do that, and nobody has. And that's why people just say, you know, I, I just want the camera right next to me. And that happens to be these. And these guys actually are very, very good cameras. These are obviously much better, because this one can't do one one thousandth of what that can do. But this one can go straight up to Facebook. And so this one has a variety of ways of connecting. It can hook up into a wireless network like at Starbucks and instantly go up to Facebook. It can become a wireless router on its own and then 
you would, from your phone, choose the wireless network that this guy creates, attach to it, and then make the two transfer images. Or if you have a droid, <coughs> all you need to do is walk up and tap it right there, and the, and the images will then transfer. Le here's a demonstration of uh, putting it up straight to Facebook. So what I did here was very slow dissolve. Let's see if that goes. Oops. What happened here? I went forward, didn't I? So it is moving, right? Oh, hang on, sorry guys. Oh, there it goes. Okay. So see, they're smart. Shot with a Sony ILC E6000. I don't know why they call that ILC. It's actually an alpha. But so what happens is, is I check it. And then, and I'll show this to you live because I'm going to hook into the B&H network and teach you how to do it. And then now you can select a service, which is Facebook. Now, this is something that you download. You can actually download applications just like on your Droid, uh, your Google Marketplace, or your Apple uh, Store. And it'll do this. It's connecting to Facebook. And this is all in real time, straight, straight from the camera, so that you can see what it's like. And then you can choose any of your photos. You've seen this before, so I made one. Well, I stuck this in my A7R folder because I had that, and then uh, I upload it. And then it goes straight up to Facebook, and there it goes right there, uploading. And it, that's really fun because we all love to share our images, and we are very impatient. And so if we take a good one, we want to get it out right away. And so see right there, I've actually stuck it on there, and you can see that it's hit my wall. In fact, on this little uh, Sony, it has a web browser. It's very, very interesting. You go on there, and like when I was at my hotel, it, uh, it says, you know, Four Seasons Login. And I was, you know, ha had to type in and get onto their network. And, um, but it, it does that. It's, it's, you can actually see, you can't like access CNN directly, but you can actually see the browser on the on the little window so it does take some battery power though so when you you know turn turn your camera on it defaults to uh, wireless and I found that I have much more battery life if I put it in airplane mode and it's not all the time that you're going to need to be turning this into a wireless device because it's not like you're reaching getting text messages from it it's only during those times that you want to um, create uh, the sharing situation or something like that. So uh, just advice on the use of mm -hmm. that. And, and I'll, I'll show you a couple other really handy tips. But it really helps with your battery life to put that on airplane mode. And I'll show you that in a little bit. So also, you can direct, directly upload to your camera. And this is what happens. So this is a screen from my iPhone. And so when I'm choosing my network, it'll say, it'll ask you to choose the direct um, a connection to that guy and then what happens is there's a app that you can download it's called play memories and what happens is is it will then copy the image from your camera because this is now a Wi-Fi uh, router basically and then your camera is going to upload those images into it and then from there you can upload it to social media if you want and that's handy when you're somewhere where there is no network. If, there's, if you're not at a Starbucks or you're not somewhere that has a network or even at home, what I do is I make these guys download to my iPhone from my iPhone, then I put it up to Instagram or uh, Facebook or Flickr or whatever. So you can go, you go directly to Flickr from that also. And I'll show you some other Play Memories applications. They got a cool one which is called Motion, I think something, where if a person's doing a cartwheel, it will actually show that. Or if someone's doing a jump on a snowboard, it'll show, you know, that arc of the flying. It's pretty fun. It's actually pretty interesting. They have a lot of different ones. They've got time lapse ones. So just like you would download apps on your iPhone, you can download apps from the Sony store into your camera and customize it so that you can make it do the things that you want it to do. Now again, here are the adapters, and I think this is a key point, that you can put different lenses on your uh, camera. So like right there, I have that uh, 70 to 200 stuck on there. And it, 
it shoots great. It also allows you to micro align your lenses. The other thing cool about this heads up display that I really like, and I configure it so that I can see all the things that I want to see. This I like. I don't need to take my eye away from the viewfinder to see what my shutter speed or my aperture is. And way, way back in the old days of film, you would have these little optical windows. In fact, Nikon would have a window that would magnify right down on the barrel that you would turn to show your aperture. And that's what I'm used to because I want to see what my shutter speed and my aperture are. And I want to be able to see that. I mean, maybe I could preview the depth of field if I wanted to, but um, I want to see what, what that information is. So this is right here is on aperture priority mode. We're at 169 resolution, 10 megapixel, just because I was going to upload this on the internet. If I was in video, then I'd be at 24 frames per second. I'll talk about why that's better. And um, here's my exposure override, my ISO and my shutter speed. So that is all as my fighter pilot mode. I want to see all of those goodies because that's going to affect how I do my shot. So, okay, let's, uh, let's switch over to the camera so I can show you. It's time to switch over to the camera. Okay, so we are now on the camera itself and I'm going to take you on a little guided tour of what this camera does. So, by the way, I have a channel called SonyA6000.com and if you want I have a, I think it's a three hour video on exactly how to work every different aspect how to customize it for macro shooting how to customize it for portrait shooting and all that and it's called unleashing the power of the A6000 because I promise you this the manual won't teach you any of this stuff. <laughs> the manual has nothing and, and the funny thing is is that I searched the internet far and wide to find out uh, information on how to use this thing and nobody had it because uh, w what they sent me was one of the first. It wasn't even available yet. I think I got it in mid-April. Then um, on top, so you know what was really funny is I was actually talking to one of the Sony engineers as we were kind of going through all of the little stuff and I had the best tech support in the world. I had the cell number for one of the Sony engineers which was awesome. But armed with that, I thought, with a camera this revolutionary and no information out there, I'm going to have to make a pretty intense video so that people can understand what it's capable of doing. Because if I don't do that, then this camera might not get the attention it deserves. And so I've been really interesting, right? Because I've been on this personal campaign uh, as a non-Sony spokesperson to get people excited about a camera that I have no real affiliation with. Um, but let's go through what this does and I'll, I'll just go through the menu and I'll, I'll briefly show you quickly <coughs> all the different things that you can set up and the way that they work. So we'll just go through the menus real quick and uh, right there. So of course this is um, aspect ratio and quality and all that. And I always keep these on very high. Aspect ratio is 3 to 2 when I'm shooting prints because that'll give you your 4x6 print, your 5x7 print, your 8x10 print. 16.9 is something that I do when I'm doing my movies. And I do a lot, lot of videos, as you can imagine, being a father of young children. Um, so my record setting is always on 24, not 60. And I do want to show you what, what the difference is. Do you guys know what the difference is between 24 and 60? Well, obviously, there's a lot more frames. So if you're shooting, say, tennis or something like that, you can, you can, in your editing software, go to slow motion. But the 60 mode is, it looks like a, you're watching a soap opera or a camcorder. And I'll show you the difference. 24 is what we call cinematic. Film was 24 frames per second, and it had the smooth look as you're transitioning around. So let me put it on 24, and I'll just kind of show you what that looks like. So let's go ahead and <coughs> we'll hit... Uh, movie and we're recording okay so didn't that kind of look okay that looks normal and that's what you would expect okay so we'll stop that there and then now I'll go back to my menu and I'll put it on 60 frames per second I just put it on the small size so we don't take a whole shebang of room and I'll put it on this now do you, I don't know if you can see but how how it moves around is very soap opera like I don't know if you can tell but um, there's a, on your plasma TVs, there are, what are they called? There's plasma TVs and then there's, what's the other one called? LED. And the LEDs have a scan rate that look very, very cheap. It looks like when they're moving from side to side, it, it 
it just looks wrong. I, and I don't know if, if you can see it, I can see it clear as a bell that this looks like a camcorder to me. Okay, now watch, let me go back to the other guy. And I'll go back, this one right here is a 24. And you see right there where it, it looks, this looks like a film. It doesn't have that same kind of, <clears throat> can't explain, it's almost like this immediacy in that camcorder look, which I find very unattractive. So anybody who's uh, cinematic will always choose the 24 uh, uh, on the video. So, and then, the, now, RAW versus JPEG. I'm a JPEG shooter. RAW's great because it will, of course, give you everything that, that ever happened to it. And you have more mid-tone range and you have, uh, you know, wider gamut. And uh, so you, you have a lot more flexibility. But the creativity that you choose in your viewfinder won't show. It'll show on your viewfinder as you're shooting. So say, for example, you're shooting in black and white mode. It'll show on that. But when you go to your uh, RAW, it will just give you the RAW image. You can shoot RAW plus JPEG, which is fun. But I found that the exposures are so accurate on this that you could shoot all day long in JPEG and not need to go into your image processing software. I've always found that people who use imaging processing software don't have their monitors calibrated correctly and they always wind up kind of screwing, screwing everything up anyway. So, um, and then plus I think people get a little, I don't know, OCD about they have to change every image just because they can. And the, ca the camera does a very good job with the exposure, so. Now right down here, the file format, AVCHD, this is actually quite confusing, especially if you're using a Macintosh. The file format's very weird in that when you shoot a number of videos, it comes out as one folder called private and in it has all your different videos. Very, very hard because they're not different file names to discern one video from the other. So say for example I have 60 minutes of video already on it and then I add another four minutes and all the one is the last four minutes. On a Mac, you're going to have to transfer the entire 64 minutes before you can see the four minutes. Now that doesn't happen on the MP4. But the MP4 is not the highest resolution. If you want to go 1920, you have to go with AVCHD. And the MP4 is fine for if you're just going up to YouTube. It's not a high resolution. I wouldn't recommend it. But, uh, but the AVCHD is kind of a, a very interesting file format to use once you get into the computer. And for that, I do have a, a video on YouTube to teach you how to handle that. Record setting, of course, I'm never going to put it on uh, 60 myself. Okay, so that'll tell you that you can't record a regular DVD because it's high re res. Drive mode, continue shooting. Now, th anything that you want to do on the computer is accessible in these menus, but much, much faster to do once you customize these buttons. So flash mode, very cool because it has different modes. It's got a pop-up flash it, it, that uh, is, you know, kind of silly because it's so small. But it actually doesn't do a bad job if you're about five feet away. And it's funny. It's just funny. It's a little funny guy. Um, tiny, tiny, tiny thing. But it does a flash. And so, as you can see right there, uh, don't you love it when I take pictures and I don't tell you they're coming? <laughs> I'll erase it. Don't worry. Um, but anyway, so, uh, but the different flash modes are, when, you know, when you can go wireless, you can go slow. Slow is used for when you're shooting indoors because you want to open up the uh, ambient light. And that's part of the fun in the decision-making process that this thing will do. Rear is really kind of for a special effect. When you're in really low light situations and a person is walking horizontally across your frame and you want to get a black shadow behind them, then you put it on rear. If you don't have it on rear, they're going to walk into their ambient light and you won't have that cool look. And then wireless, is my favorite because I can do so many really cool things uh, to use with that. So the wireless function actually turns this little light into a master controller and it will control the slaves. So that is uh, something you do. Flash compensation is the mixture between the front and the back. I normally leave that at zero because it's such a good system. And then the focus mode. Now this is something that is not in any other camera doesn't look like it's, you know, fireworks or anything. It's just called automatic autofocus. Well, what is automatic autofocus? Automatic autofocus is 
a decision maker. It decides if you're going to be on single shot mode or continuous mode. Now single shot means that it'll lock the focus the minute you depress this button halfway. You all know what that's like. It goes zip and then it stays there, waits for you to shoot. Continuous means while your finger's down, it's constantly moving around, and this is something that's suicide for a typical Canon or Nikon. AFA will choose if you should be in single shot mode or continuous. Basically what it does is it will put it in still shot mode if your subject is not moving. If your subject is moving, it'll put it in continuous mode, and I really like that. <clears throat> this is uh, the manual focus is kind of cool because it has uh, the ability to, I think I've customized this, when you go, when you touch the focus ring, oh I didn't customize this yet, uh, when you touch the focus ring it'll magnify 16 times and then you hit the button and it'll go back. Really fun uh, to play with that mode. Okay, so <clears throat> I'll go through here. Focus area, wide. This is the one you should use on this camera and no other camera. Here's your choices. You can go wide or zone. Uh, which breaks it up into different zones, or center, which is the one that I would use for my Nikon or Sony. I would use center, and then I would, uh, let me just show you what it looks like. Okay, this is center, and so what happens is, you see the little square right there? What, what it wants me to do is it wants me to go like that, hold the button down, then reposition, and then fire. Ooh, I just shot three shots, because uh, that was on mode. Okay, that's what I would have to do with a typical Canon or Nikon. But on this one, I haven't turned it on yet um, in this mode, so I'm just going to go to... Uh, oh, and this one is the movable spot. Now this means joystick. That means that you're going to say, oh, I want those eyeballs. Okay, wait, uh, move it over there. Okay, now let's fire. That's how slow it is on a, in a typical world. And um, and that's one that I wouldn't suggest. However, if you don't know what this computer, uh, this camera does, you'll automatically choose one of those two modes. And uh, you know, you typically would never use uh, something where it picks the focus area. But this one you can, and so choose wide. And I'll show you the other companion settings that you have to use and able to do that. Autofocus illuminator, always turn that off because it looks like a, heli a police helicopter is arriving on the scene. It throws out such a big red cast that it's actually quite alarming. Um, a drive speed, of course, this is something you don't need to focus in the uh, camera. Autofocus track duration, that's really kind of fun too because you can tell the camera how long to go before you let go of the thing that you chose. And that's under track duration. So if you're on high, high means that it'll forget very, very quickly which one you wanted. Remember how I was showing the girl and I'm going around and very, very sticky around my boy and all the bubbles were going around? Just imagine if you're at St. Mark's in Venice and all those, you know, all those seagulls go, are they seagulls or doves? They're doves. They all go flying and you've got maybe someone running through it, but it doesn't get confused by the doves. Keep that on normal. But if you wanted to get maybe more confused and not be so sticky on hanging on to things, then uh, put it on high. That's one of the key features of this. Exposure compensation, that's all, nothing really new. Uh, ISO auto, okay, I want to talk about this because ISO auto is something that a lot of professional photographers haven't yet really grasped. I think it's an awesome thing. Awesome, because I can put the camera on manual mode, not worry that I'm falling out of range. Like, let's say for example, I'm shooting a wedding, I'm indoors, and I say, you know, I want these shots to be at about 1 25th of a second at f1.4. And all of a sudden the bride goes running out to the limousine, and I forget to change my ISO. Boom, 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 boom. All of a sudden I've got these shots that are five shots overexposed because I might have had it at ISO 1600 or 800. What ISO Auto does is it allows you to pick the shutter speed and the, the aperture in manual mode, lock it on that, always get the right exposure and forget about everything else because it will change the ISO for you. Which means that you have the ability to control your manual camera without worrying about if the exposure is going to be right because the, the, the ISO will shift. And that's really super fun. That's something that I like to do a lot when I'm shooting in manual 
is put it on ISO auto. Now when I'm shooting in special conditions outdoors where I want to take down the ambient light and darken it quite a bit, then I'll put it, I'll choose maybe one of the lower ISO speeds, but that's a little bit of an advanced topic. Now, what's also really cool about this is see right here, people say, you know what, I don't really like shooting anything more than 1600. Well, fine, then just tell it that you don't want to shoot more than 1600 and it will stop at 1600. It won't take you past that. You know what, I found great results at 6400. <clears throat> on this one and it'll go all the way up to 25600 and what I did is on my YouTube channel I actually took the um, noise reduction and I did a demonstration of how that works. I, I photographed a dollar bill and show how, how the noise reduction worked at 25600 and show you what happens with the detail. It's quite interesting but I found that I'm very safe all the way up to 6400 and that's a lot of fun to be able to shoot like that. It's not a full frame sensor, it doesn't have large pixels, so it's not known for being very good with uh, ISO, but you know what, in, in practical uses, I think it's, it's fine. So that's that. And then metering mode, this is something again that you typically would probably have to work around with in the Canon or Nikon. This is, what, this is the old days where they had five zone metering, so it basically takes splits it up in the zone, center, and then the edges, and it kind of figures out what it thinks that you want. Um, this is center weighted. You wouldn't want to use that, and you wouldn't want to use uh, spot either, because I'm going to teach you how to get around those and use the multi-zone metering. So that is a setup that you'd want. <coughs> White balance. Boy, I've got probably four hours on YouTube on just white balance alone. I'm going to teach you how to use that. In fact, I'll teach you how to use it right now. So, um, because I don't want to go out of order. So let's talk about white balance. White balance, if you're in auto white balance, the camera does what it can to try to figure out how close we are to having a neutral color. After all, that's what white balance is. It's neutral color balance. And what, what I like about, auto, uh, about custom white balance is that it's 100% accurate. I think it's on an 8-bit image, it's 16.8 million accuracy or something like that. Let me show you how fast it is to set up a custom white balance on the A7, uh, A6000. So we'll go right here to white balance, and then in, instead of auto, I'm going to go all the way down here. Now, and this, by the way, is something you can see in your viewfinder. So let's say, for example, we know when we're in fluorescent lighting, but look at, there's different fluorescence. There's cool white, there's warm white, and there's day white. And if you look at each of these lights, you can see they're all a different color. So it's not a good idea to choose fluorescent. Of, of all of them, it's probably the least accurate. Uh, you know. And then there's flash. Now you see flash is really warm because we're you know, under fluorescent light. Color temperature, you can, you can change that. And this is super fun to play with. It's a whole other topic. Auto white balance underwater? Of course, when we're diving, we want to use auto white balance underwater. But this is the one that we're going to play with is the custom white balance. Do you have your little dome? Yeah. Okay, so watch how fast it is to set up a custom white balance and achieve perfect color. So just go and uh, hold this like right in front of your face, the other way though, like you're a greyhound with a muzzle, and look toward me. So what happens here is I'm going to set it <coughs> like this. And what it'll do is it'll give me a circle. And so that's all you do is you press that center button right there and it will now record that. And it tells me that we are at 3700 degrees Kelvin and we're two steps toward magenta on the green to magenta scale. That, yeah, we're, we're fine. That is completely perfect lighting. And if you look on here, it's like the, the shirt on the gentleman, the chairs are all completely gray. Uh, your shirt is a turquoise color back there or something like that. This is 100% accurate. And what I like about the ability to, to hold that <clears throat> and call that a custom, custom white balance is that now um, I only need to do this once. So long as the light doesn't change, I'll have perfect color. So if you're doing product photography or flower photography or something like that and you want to have uh, perfect uh, white balance, and have the color perfect, that's all you need to do. Now what you just saw her hold up was uh, part of my, uh, the Gary Fong uh, color calibration kit. There's a clear, uh, clear dome and one that's like that. And the reason why it's round is because, we don't have a gray card here, but 
I will have you hold up the back of this. Um, go ahead and take that guy right there. So let me show you the difference between... <coughs> okay, so uh, hold up that card uh, the other direction. Yeah. Oh, wait, you did have it right. Turn it the other way, sorry. Now just kind of move it up, down, or whatever. Uh, not that much, but little micro moves. Yeah, see that? Now do you see how the color changes whenever she moves it? And the reason that happens is because the light that's hitting it is different from wherever she moves it. She might be more into the uh, fluorescent or whatever. And just the tiniest moves changes the color. In the old days, we used to use gray cards. And I had problems with the gray cards too because the color would constantly change. So what I did was, go ahead and grab the round, round guy. So what I did was I made these guys in round. And what that does is that captures all of the light that's hitting her face. A face is three-dimensional. And so the, the color balance area, you see how they give you this nice little circle right there. And <clears throat> see that circle? It's perfect because it's picking up all the color that's hitting that, that ball. And so if it's from above uh, to the side, there might be a red brick wall on the side. There might be green grass uh, over there. And there might be daylight from above. If you use any flat measuring surface, you'll get not the accurate color because you're not averaging over the entire thing. Okay, that's fine. So, um, and then the other thing too, oh, you know what? Um, let me go back and the other thing too that you can do is, so we're at the 3700K setting. This is uh, perfectly right on. I'm just gonna go ahead and choose you as a focus point. Okay, hold it to the side of your face, yeah. Okay, or actually, uh, but aim toward me. <clears throat> actually, put, put it right in front again, like you had it, and then we'll just do a shot like that. So, <clears throat> if we do one shot like that, and then later, uh, go ahead and take it away, oxygen mask. Please fix, uh, fix your own before help assisting others. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, what happens is, is if I was in my post-production, <clears throat> I would put my Lightroom, or my Photoshop, or whatever, my uh, info color uh, neutral thing and put it right on there with a tool size that big and then lock that. Then I would use that color setting to post process all of the rest of my images if you're in Lightroom or anything like that. So you got a double whammy here. Not only do you have complete neutral at the time of capture, which would then change the color temperature of your white balance, but when you're shooting, uh, when you're post processing, you would then neutralize it there, and you would have color accuracy that's phenomenal. And that's the thing, is when you're looking at your images, you go, hmm, something doesn't look right. It's the color. It's, or it's the exposure. And, and that's the nice part about being able to uh, object track, is the exposure. Okay, um, <clears throat> auto high dy dynamic range, that's all uh, kind of not, not as exciting as some of the other features here. So let me show you creative style. And I really like creative style because I can go to these different ones. Neutral is my choice, by the way. Whenever you're shooting, I like to choose neutral because we can always increase the color saturation or the contrast of an image, but we can't decrease it. And the inability to decrease will like um, make your colors not as rich in the midtones. Why is that important? Well, let's just think in our mind, what does a rose look like? Is it a solid red rose or does it have many many shades of pink to red to crimson and all that and that's what gives it its three dimensionality is the ability to capture many different colors of red the way I like to say it is if you are a person who has crayons and you get eight crayons versus a 64 crayon box the more crayons you have the more ability you have to fill in the colors that are in between that's where you get what I call mid-range detail, and that's where you need to stay away from high contrast or high saturation. Typically, most of your cameras will be set to something like Vivid or Standard, which actually boosts the sharpness or the contrast or the saturation. And, uh, and that looks fine if you're in the camera store comparing it to the other ones, but when you really want to get that most accurate color, go to neutral. This is Portrait landscape, <coughs> black and white. This is the one I really like. The ability to shoot in black and white, but see it in your eyeball, and that's different than you could ever have with your, uh, with your uh, optical viewfinder. So that's what I do. I go between black and white and uh, color a lot. Picture effect, this one's kind of silly. 
Um, picture effect is kind of like Instagram, and it's kind of funny, you know, like things like that. I stay away from it because it's a little bit too much for me. And the pro cameras, like the A7R and A99, they won't have things like that. So this one's kind of like more for a bigger uh, market. High ISO noise reduction, I have a whole video on how that works and how it will take your very high ISO and reduce it. This one right here, lock on autofocus, is probably the best feature of this camera. This one right here, memorize what this one does because this is how I get to choose the face I want. Watch this. Once I choose that, it knows her. And then, tell you what, why don't you walk backwards and I'm just gonna follow you around and maybe squat down in between other people so that your face is among others. So she just left and now she's gonna come back in. Let's go ahead and squat down and there. So I'll go like this, I'm gonna choose you Okay, and now see the double, let's see the double on her. Okay, so uh, Molly just walk around and then, uh, well, and then go back and now squat down. Yeah, see, so it's on her. Now there's other people, see these boxes? There's other, other boxes on other faces, but it knows I want her. And that's the cool thing, so now, there we go. And now tell you what, I'd like you to do is I would like you to uh, go ahead and squat down again. And then, so we're focused on her. Uh, go forward, kind of do a little very fast move forward. Okay, so let's look at that. <laughs> and so attract her. I'm a cheap, cheapskate with cards. You can do much better than that. Yeah, we're on a slow, a slow ISO here. Um, but that's seven frames per second. So it tracks, tracks her. I wonder why it, it went to, are you guys at the same distance away? Kind of looks like it, it caught on that guy right there. Um, but that's how that works. So when you're, when you're shooting, you lock on the face right there and then it knows. Now we're gonna go ahead and move you off the screen. And now there's other faces, yeah, but none of them have the double box. You're not Molly, we don't want you. Where's Molly? Oh, there she is. And this is something that I can't do. Now, I've got this thing open up to, uh, well, this is F4 right now. Let me open it up to 118. And this is where you'll see it's really dramatic. By the way, do you see in here how, that's my, my eyepiece. This is what I'm seeing is those, those things coming across. So I want to shoot at 18. I can see that right here in my eyeball, like that. Now, <clears throat> let's say, for example, I want to go to manual mode. When I move my dial, I have the setup to show me in my eyepiece what mode I'm on. Do you know why I like that? Because this way, I don't have to take my eye off the uh, camera. I look up here, see where my dial's at. I can actually sit in here and shoot. Now, the minute you buy this camera to have the most fun from day one, put it on the green mode, intelligent auto, and I'll show you why. Because what it does, look at that, right up there, portrait. It knows that it's a portrait. And then if I were to put it out toward the store, maybe. Wait, oh, there's still people there, okay. But it changes the mode. See, the portrait's gone. If I were to put it on a landscape, it would say landscape. And the funny thing is, is if I put a baby in there, it'll say baby. <laughs> and that's really quite interesting. So if you're shooting and you just want to have the, the computer take over all your controls, put it on that and it will then choose what it thinks that you need. Here's another thing that's uh, super fun to do. Uh, so that, that would be the very, very beginning. Then once you're away from the green mode, so say for example, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, I gotta shoot a wedding. Put it on green mode if you don't know what you're doing. It will, it will make really, really good decisions for you. Look, it takes, it takes over every control. I can't change the ISO, I can't change the anything. I can't change anything about this. In fact, I can't even change the creative style. I can't turn it to black and white if I wanted to because all of them are disabled because it thinks that uh, I want the camera to take full control. So this is complete autopilot. And when you're in portrait mode, what it does is it will turn the color into the portrait color. When you put it into baby mode, it actually gives the baby a slightly more of a blush look. 
And it's quite, quite something. Okay, let's do something else that's really kind of fun. Let's do smile and face detection. So I always have face detection on. The king's hat right here is register faces, and I think it'll register 12? What, how many will it do? Uh, how many faces? Is it 12 or 14? Register? Yeah, 12, I think it's 12. So if you're shooting a wedding at the beginning of the day, register the bride's face, the groom's face, maid of honor, you know, whatever. And then if you're shooting the cocktail hour and you've got a really long lens and you're way off in the background, there's all these people around, you just basically just go, oh, oh bride, groom, and it'll find those faces. It'll instantly put the double box around the faces that you've registered. It's so fun to let the camera do all of this stuff. Now, face detection being on is something that I normally do when I'm shooting portraits. If you're not shooting portraits or you're just doing landscapes, this is a waste of time. This one's funny. Smile shutter on big smile, on slight smile, on normal smile. Now, here's what happens here, and I know it's really uh, something that you might just kind of wonder, is, is this useful at all? Well, I'll tell you what it does. It does not take over your finger. In fact, I can, just, I can still shoot however I want, but go ahead and smile for me, Molly. See, so the minute that she smiles, it shoots. So if I'm like, oh, oh, I fell asleep. What? Oh, oh, goodness gracious. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I forgot. Um, so it does that. And so, and that really does help because it automates. So it's not going to take over. Don't smile. It's not going to take over because once I shoot, I still have control. But it's going to throw images into the mix. And so you can just say, you know what? I don't feel like, I don't feel like broad smile. I feel like um, you know, just kind of regular, regular smiles or whatever, and you, you can change that. So that's really kind of fun. Um, so that's smile detection. Let me put this guy back on to program for soft skin effect. Now, soft skin effect is great for... <laughs> no, I'm going to put it on Molly. Um, it's, watch what it does. And all this does really is it saves you processing time. There's a whole bunch of different, you know, post-processing software that you can use that will do soft skin effect. But on this one, what I'll do is I'll put it on this menu guy here. Oh, we got to put you on. If I, when it's gray, grayed out, it'll say, oh, it won't work on continuous shooting because I can't think that fast. So I'm going to change the drive mode to single shot. And then now I'll go back to menu and then do soft skin effect. And then I can put it on off or low, medium or high. Molly, come in closer so I can get in really, uh, go ahead and sit down. I think the light was better there. I'll show you what soft skin effect does. And no matter who you are, it's, uh, it's fun to have. Okay, so that's a shot with soft skin effect. Let me show you what it looks like. Can you see the difference? So let's go back to regular, and then let's go back to soft skin effect. Regular, soft skin effect. And what it does is it finds the flesh tones, and it just basically uh, cleans them up. Now, if you're shooting in RAW, you're not going to, um, it's not going to stick. In fact, most of these functions don't stick uh, when you're shooting in RAW. But, uh, so you can put it on high, or you can put it on low, or mid. And so, depending on the age of your subject, uh, or how, how much they want it to be, uh, you know, softened up, you can use that. And so there's a lot of uh, different processing things. Auto object framing is very interesting if you're a sleepy photographer and you're, uh, you know, often caught missing shots because you're not really all quite there. So let, let me show you auto object framing. Let's put this right here and just say that, you know, I'm just kind of not really with it, and I forgot to recrop. So we'll go to position. What it will do is it'll put the face into rule of thirds. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't override your cropping. It will give you an additional shot. So it throws two in there. One was you doing it wrong, and the other one is, I think that's what you mean. So when people say, you know, I, I don't really like this taking over my cropping, it's not going to take over. It's going to add another one because it thinks that you made a mistake. And so all of these things here, I know it, it might be surprising, but it is really handy to someone like myself as a uh, professional photographer. Now, um, 
all these other things. Zebra, the zebra's really neat because it shows you blown out areas in a barbershop stripe and things like that. These are all wonderful, uh, all wonderful different ones. And in my uh, Sony a6000.com website, I teach you how to use all of these peaking level, peaking color. This is for manual focus. When you put it on peaking color, it'll show you everything that's in focus in red. And that's kind of fun. Um, okay, so let's just go through these. Pre-autofocus, always leave that off, because if you use uh, pre-autofocus and you, um, what it basically will do, a focus before you touch the shutter, and that's a huge drain on your batteries. Um, let me see what else is fun. E front curtain shutter, that's always left on. That's one of the benefits of having this type of uh, uh, mirrorless thing. Face registration, you always already saw. Uh, micro adjustment for uh, autofocus and lens compensation, those are when you're using the adapters and you want to get those adapters nailed in. Okay, custom uh, function. Hey, by the way, how am I on time? How much time do I have left? 40 minutes. Okay, good. Because um, I want to teach you how, how these things work. And it's okay, so uh, function menu set. And this is really fun too because you can customize what your fighter. Dis a heads up display says, do you really care about flash mode? If not, go over here and choose something else. Maybe you want to see what the drive mode is or something like that or what ISO you're on or lock on autofocus. So you can customize all of that to show what the uh, buttons are. Now this is what I typically have. I really like having um, uh, all of these things on. So that's kind of that. So this is what shows up on my screen. You can customize your screen because there's many other choices you can make. This one right here is one of my favorites, the custom key settings. Custom key settings allow you to overwrite the decals on the buttons and make them whatever you want them to be. So for example, there's a big fat auto exposure lock button. I don't often use auto exposure lock because I don't need it because the subject tracking is so good. So I can choose maybe picture effect or soft skin effect, turn it on, turn it off, or whatever. All of these different things can be chosen instead of the AEL. And what's neat is you can put them into different memory banks. So say, for example, you say memory bank one is for when I'm doing landscape photography. Memory bank two is when I'm doing portrait photography. And then all of these things are going to be memorized into that register. And uh, so that's what I do here. But uh, the custom button one, you see this eye autofocus? It's not on any of the buttons when you buy the camera uh, and open it from the box. So that cool eye autofocus function is uh, only on when you customize a button for it. Let me show you how this thing works. This is super fun because I've got myself right here. Very, very fast lens. Uh, let's open it up to f1.8, which is why we pay all this extra money for. And then I'm going to put the custom one button. Watch this. Eyeball. And that, to me, is extremely fun because how would I do that otherwise? And so it will lock on that, and it will focus on the eyeball and fire. And that's what you, know, you always hear about in portraiture. Oh, the eyes weren't in focus or whatever, something like that. And so, but that, you, you will never find that function unless you customize the menu. So you need to know about customizing the menu. So let's go back into this. And then dial wheel setup. This is for something that uh, if you've got two different wheels here, so if you want the one in the back to be shutter speed and the one in the front to be aperture, which makes more sense to me because the aperture ring is t normally in the front, then you just go ahead and change that. Um, what other, oh, send a smartphone. So this is the fun part here where we can now say, I've got this image and I wanna send it to my smartphone It'll say Wi-Fi standby, <clears throat> and then uh, right there, those of you who have phones, you will now see there's a network that's coming from this camera, and it's called that, and then there's a password, and it's that. And then so what happens is, is once you do that, <clears throat> as this guy is now transmitting as a wireless hub, you can then transfer your images back and forth between your smartphone, rather than having to you know, go back and forth and access it through the different, uh, the different modes. Okay, so let's see, that's, uh, where are we here? Oh, I'm back over here. Where was I? Send a smartphone. Okay. 
airplane mode I already told you about. <coughs> Access point set, that's just your Wi-Fi. So right here, I'm looking for, oh, there's B&H Superstores. How familiar is this? But this is a camera that's doing it now, right? So now I'm going to connect to B&H, and I will have, now I'm registered, so now I've got the ability to browse. So now that I'm in here, uh, I can go to my application list right there. And these are the ones that I've just uploaded. This is motion shot, direct upload. Now, play memories online. Let me show you how this works. We'll go back here. We'll get out of this application, and I'll show you what we're going to do here. We're going to go to this right there and the application list. Motion Shot. This is one that I just downloaded, and I think it was about five bucks. So this is kind of like the Droid Store here, where you can go over to see Play Memories camera apps. And once I hook up into there, it's going to find the B&H access point. <coughs> And then it's going to show my uh, all the different apps that are available in the App Store. So these are some that I've downloaded. This one's kind of fun, Motion Shot. This one is something that you have to buy separately. But uh, we're going to give this a go, because I've never played with this before, and I'm anxious to see what it does. OK, we're going to do something where we play with the new toy. And in these, uh, by the way, Always turn off your cameras before you pull the lens off because you can see right now, you can see the uh, sensor. Uh, it's, uh, it's electronically charged. So if you take it off and the camera's on, it's a static magnet. When I turn it back on, it's going to uh, buzz off the dirt and the particles. But uh, OK, so now let's see what happens here. Be on. This will be kind of fun to see what happens because I have not yet played with this toy. All right, so I'm going to lock on mo Molly. Function disabled. Why are you disabled? What am I on? Oh, I'm on the play memories. Okay, got it. Okay. So Molly, what we're going to do, I'm going to have you go to the end of the aisle. Have you guys played with this before? Am I doing it right? Okay. And... I have it on slow though. Let's just let's check check the functions here. Oh, it's on high. Okay, so Molly, I want you to do a cartwheel. <laughs> no, actually, but but I do want you to move very very quickly uh, across the frame. Let's see how it goes. Okay, so one, two, three, go. I, I've I've seen it and I downloaded it. La <laughs> okay, so she has to move faster, or what's the? Uh, I can change the speed, right? Wait, let's go to function. Function, and it's, I changed it last night. See up here? I was able to change that. Oh, there, high to low. There, OK. Now, um, Molly, move faster, and it's going to capture slower. OK, go. That's more fun. I think that should work. OK, so now. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's cool. But like, so if somebody, I, I have this on a high ISO also. But like if you're doing, like, say, snowboarding or something like that, and someone's doing a trick, you can do that. And this is would take you so much long. It would take you forever to mask every single one and then layer them, you know. So you'd have to have to do all that. Oh, you got rid of number five. Yep. Oh, so you can fun. Actually press up and down. Like, see, I'm pressing. The, oh, I'm pressing wow. The on the back. Oh, that's cool. Huh. That's awesome. Yeah. Toys. Um, but that's that's a downloadable app. And it also has like the ability to do stars at night or time lapse or whatever. And those are different apps. So let's get out of this application and exit application. So we're now, because what that did was it took the entire camera over to do that. And then um, these are view modes. So this is not that super interesting. Um, 
tile menu. This is if you're a Nex user and you miss the old tiles. So that what that does is it just takes the menu into the old style like that, which some people actually prefer. I just I know the old the old ones, so let's get out of this camera settings. Um, playback, I'm probably there. Okay, and then what else? Cleaning arrows. Yeah, I think that's basically it in terms of uh, in terms of the usage. So. Yeah, this won't do 4K, no. It's just 1920, 1080, 1080, uh, 1080p. So, anyway, but yeah. Great, I think we did a pretty good job of covering what it does. Thanks for coming. Hope you're excited, because it's fun. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, BNH has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.